And welcome back here to Live Now from Fox. I'm Andrew Kraft. Thanks so much for being with us. Uh, we are, in the next couple of hours, going to be reflecting, remembering over the last year since Russia invaded the country of Ukraine, the sovereign country of the Ukraine. We'll be speaking uh, to reporters who have covered the war ever since, to economists, to former ambassadors, to national security experts about what to expect, as well as we go now into year two. Of course, this has so many broader impacts, not only on Europe and the world, but also here at home uh, in the United States as well. Uh, and we thank you for joining us. Uh, to start it all off, we spoke with Fox News foreign affairs correspondent Trey Yinkst from Kiev uh, about his experiences, his reflections, his memories uh, there covering the war. Let's listen. Joining us now here on Live Now from Fox, from Kiev, Ukraine, is Fox News correspondent Trey Yanks. Trey, you've been covering the war for the last year. You've been almost uh, there in Ukraine nonstop for every twist and turn of this war. When you walk the streets of Kiev and you talk to residents there, are they war weary or are they more emboldened than ever to finish this to get a victory there? It's a great question, and many residents of Kyiv have become so used to this war and the air raid sirens that sound often daily that they've just figured out a way to live amid the conflict. And it's a sad reality for the Ukrainian people, but a reality they were forced into when almost exactly a year ago, Russia invaded this country from the north and from the south and from the east. And while Ukrainian civilians have been able to push back much of this offensive, they are fighting very difficult and bloody battles in the eastern part of Ukraine. We just returned from the southern front line in the Zaporizhia region, where villages and towns are completely abandoned, many destroyed as a result of Russian shelling. And this is really just the tip of the iceberg because so many Ukrainians have suffered throughout this conflict, millions displaced, thousands killed. And those that we see around the capital city here in Kyiv are simply used to what's happening. And it is just this stark reality amid conflict. It's so interesting how, you know, parts of the country, there are so many disparate regions where it can seem like normal. And then, of course, in the east, there is just a horrible, horrible war and fighting going on each and every day. But when you talk about infrastructure, when you talk about the social safety net services, businesses, schools still operating, is there a sense of normalcy? So businesses and schools are still operating across much of the country, and it is a new sense of normalcy for the population here. We visited a school outside of the city of Dnipro last week, and we spoke with students ranging from six years old to 10 or 11 years old, and they were drawing flowers and flags and cards for soldiers on the front lines. And these are kids who should be enjoying their lives. They should be playing outside. They should be going to recess and talking with their friends and learning about what it's like to exist. But now they're having to learn what it's like to exist amid a war. And so these young Ukrainians, they talk about things like drones and missiles and the need to go into bomb shelters where they celebrated Christmas in that school. And it is such a sad reality because so many Ukrainians are affected by this conflict. UNICEF just came out with some new numbers this week indicating that more than 1.5 million young Ukrainians are suffering from PTSD or depression as a result of this war. And I think that really highlights and underscores the effect that a conflict this large has on the civilian population. It will affect the Ukrainian people for generations to come. And no matter what officials here in the capital of Kyiv do, no matter how much money and support flows into this country, there are these realities that the Ukrainian people must face. And this conflict does continue amid threats of more missile fire, rocket fire, and shelling across this country. Yeah, something I've been impressed with throughout the year is the you know, information war, the information space uh, on the part of the Ukrainian government, on Ukrainian media outlets to get real-time information out there for the rest of the world. So I've been pretty impressed by that. Also with, obviously, Volodymyr Zelensky, the Ukrainian leader. You've spoken with him several times. What is your assessment of that of him, his office, as we go into year two. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky understands the importance of communication, not just with an international audience, but arguably more important, a domestic audience, an audience that needs to be inspired and reminded that there is leadership and a military fighting on their behalf. 
Oftentimes in war, there is a sense of hopelessness. People lose any ability to look forward because they are so consumed by what's happening in front of them. They are so consumed by their lives falling apart. So even this daily address by President Zelensky at night, just to update the Ukrainian people on what's happening, is seen as a very positive thing here. It's also a piece of information that the world can use to be reminded about this conflict, but also to be informed about this conflict. Because as you note, there's a lot of Russian disinformation taking place. We spoke today with Ukraine's defense minister, Alexei Reznikov, and I asked him about a report this week from Russia's defense ministry that Ukraine plans to invade Transnistria, a breakaway region in neighboring Moldova. And he called it an absurd idea, part of Russia's larger disinformation campaign. And he's right. The Russians from the beginning of this conflict have lied in and out. They have said they were not targeting civilian areas. Our cameras captured them targeting civilian areas. They said that the Ukrainian people were welcoming them. We watched as everyday citizens made Molotov cocktails in their living rooms, as they did everything they could. You saw the videos online of people standing in front of tanks just to do something, to stop the invasion. And so it's a massive problem, Russian disinformation. And while Vladimir Putin may be able to fool some of the people in his country, he cannot fool us, he cannot fool the international audience that is observing this conflict from an objective point of view. And the Ukrainian people know what's happening because they are experiencing it and they are seeing it with their own eyes. Yeah, and Trey, obviously, uh, from the American perspective, uh, the American taxpayer, the American media consumer, um, we don't have U.S. troops on the ground, but we are very financially invested uh, into this conflict. And from your point of view, um, is it your assessment that, you know, viewers are still watching stateside, that they're very invested in the maybe day-to-day -day occurrences of where this war is going? Or do you think that has waned over time? I think people who watch what happens in this war understand what's at stake. We spoke with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky earlier this month, and we talked about just that. What is at stake? If Ukraine loses, would Vladimir Putin stop with Ukraine? And every indication is that he would not. He could continue on to a NATO country like Poland, triggering Article 5 and then ultimately dragging in the United States in a different way, in a more direct confrontation with Russia. And so the people who pay attention to this conflict understand what's at stake. And so those are the people who are the most interested, but even those who get caught up in a news cycle and they see other things happening, maybe it's a trial or a shooting or another massive news event taking place. Part of our job as journalists on the ground is to make people care, to explain to them why it matters to them, why it affects the American people, but also to explain to them that the people here are just like them. Their mothers, their fathers, their brothers, sisters, daughters, sons, athletes, musicians, they're humans and they're suffering. And that's part of our role as journalists here to explain that and make people care. Yeah, Trey, just lastly, from a you know, personal standpoint, did you think this would last for a year? Um, you know, every kind of assumption uh, you know, that Kiev would fall within 72 hours, obviously that was thankfully not the case. But uh, from just an American journalist's perspective, did you think you'd be here a year later? I did, I think this war from the beginning looked like it was going to be something that dragged on for years. We'd seen a conflict in the Donbass region since 2014, after Russia illegally annexed Crimea, and Russian-backed separatists were fighting the Ukrainians in the Luhansk and Donetsk regions. That war dragged on and on, and it continues today as part of this larger conflict. But I think what was a big indicator to me when the war began was looking out the window of the hotel toward a police station nearby and watching as average Ukrainians were lined up down the street waiting to receive any sort of weapon that this police department would give out to them because they wanted to fight the Russians at all costs. And one man stands out to me. We met him in Maidan Square, a famous location here in the Ukrainian capital of Kyiv. And in the early days of the conflict, he looked into my eyes and he said, I'm not very good with a rifle. I don't know how to shoot a gun, but he said, I'll take my kitchen knife and I'll kill those Russian pigs. Those were his words because he was so upset and frustrated that someone disrespected the sovereignty of his homeland.
of his country, of his people. And so I think that really cut to the core of what I understood in the beginning of this conflict. And the simple message that we were receiving and we continue to receive today is that the Ukrainian people will not give up. Yeah. They are willing to fight because it really is Ukraine or death. Yeah. And, and Trey, just lastly, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up, obviously, our colleague Benjamin Hall, who was gravely injured covering this war and the loss of photojournalist Pierre Sachevsky, which, which leads me to ask you, do you ever feel, you know, in danger for your own personal safety covering this war? Is that part of the job? We have a massive responsibility to be here. It's our role as journalists who cover conflict to go to places that other people won't go and get the stories that otherwise wouldn't be told. And that responsibility, I think, permeates the industry. It permeates through everything that we do, and we understand what comes with that. And there is a, a level of risk and danger involved, but those stories wouldn't be told. We are genuinely giving a voice to the voiceless, and that is part of our work here in Ukraine. It's part of the work that our colleagues uh, were doing. It's part of the work that our colleagues continue to do. And it is critical to making sure the world is informed and educated about this conflict. Trey Yingst uh, in Kyiv, Ukraine for us. We appreciate your time and your reporting. Thanks so much, Trey. Stay safe.